So, we'll focus on racism later, though the isms translate mimetically across characteristics. What I mean by mimetically, this is a, it's like a virus that mutates. And the same discriminators that exist in one category get translated to others. Same game, different name. In terms of discrimination. So most of this basically came out of the, race, the literature on racism basically written by black social scientists. And the only thing that I, I'm the one that basically put it into six types because that's easy for folks to understand. And then the reason you do this, you can't just say something's racist. You just have to say what type of racism it is because that will give you the tactic. Okay, that will give you the tactic. So. Questions, comments? So, for example, the reason I did the whole thing on the various versions of the Bible, that's socio-structural violence. Okay? The fact that you don't know that there are multiple versions of the Bible. That so you think there's only one. As an example. Right? All right, so the first two are interpersonal between individuals and groups of individuals. The next four take through place through collective action and institution. So it's not enough to say that there's, you know, inter, you know, that there's racism and institutional racism. You have to say, I can say that there's institutional racism, but I also have to specify the type because that will give me the tactic that's being used, a way of understanding. So, for example, with socio-structural violence, you have to be able to do the math to prove it. This isn't my attitude. Look, the numbers are saying that. This isn't my opinion that hiring discrimination happened in my hire. Great, I was a beneficiary of it, but that simply means that I was so good that it made you look bad to not hire me, which was the case. Because they said stuff which was illegal, like, oh, you're overqualified. Uh, you speak, you're so articulate. Thank you, but you're supposed to consider whether I can do the job or not, <coughs> period. Teaching is a bonus. All right, so type one, verbal physical assault. They call you name or use fighting words. Preemptive strike, we talked about that. Electronic media have a physical psychological effect, but the case law is not caught up as to how to deal with cyber harassment and cyber bullying. Okay? If you read an ethnic slur on your screen because somebody's called you that, that has an effect on you psychologically on a <coughs> level that affects you emotionally. Right? But the case law hasn't caught up to that. How do you attack somebody in cyberspace? Or how do you retaliate? Type two, Peer, de, Pierce, so the, the uh, quote that defines this, racial microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults to the target person or group. They're not limited to human encounters alone, but may also be environmental in nature as when a person of color is exposed to an office setting that unintentionally assails his or her racial identity. One's racial identity can be minimized or made insignificant through the sheer exclusion of decorations or literature that represents various racial groups. Like if you work into an, walk into an office, are you represented there? So I haven't actually worked for close to 30 years for an institution that did not recognize the King holiday or let me take it off at least as a sick day. But I used to, have to, right? Even before it was an official holiday. 
What do you mean you want to take Martin Luther King's birthday off? And you're not sick? I want to do some... Wow. Okay. So now it became a national holiday in 86, right? Type 2. So, the simple inclusion of a few token posters, pictures, art books, or people cannot be interpreted, interpreted as relieving microaggressions. So, with those microaggressions in who or which culture created the office culture which would normally assail any racial identity other than white male. You could also basically say that there are gender microaggressions too. And class microaggressions and, you know, so on. So, who has allegiance to maintaining that particular culture? So, ac academe is part of generating and maintaining office culture. It teaches it. The assumption is if you're in college that we want you to get a degree unless, of course, we are exploiting you as a slave with a number on your name. In which case, we are not committed to graduating you. We are committed to making sure that you perform. And as soon as you can't perform, bye. A little too close, but hey, look at that. Are we committed to everybody's success? Hmm. That could be questioned by graduation rates. So, for example, if Eddie, Ro you know, Eddie Robinson, famous black coach at Grambling, had a greater than 80% graduation rate with his football team, an historically black college and university, what's the U of O's graduation rate for black athletes? Did 80%? Huh. Wonder. You can ask the question, do you get the answer? You could say that for Lane, too. I'm just saying. All right? Sociostructural violence. Microaggressions. So within this construct, there's microaggressions, microassaults, microinsults. So microassault is an explicit conscious racial derogation characterized primarily by a verbal or nonverbal attack meant to hurt the intended victim through name calling, avoidant behavior, or purposeful discriminatory actions. Referring to someone as colored or oriental, half breed, or other <coughs> racial epithets or dated terms. So, particularly, it's either a racial epithet or a dated term in the 21st century. Nobody should be being called colored unless the person is an old white person who's 84 from the South. Then you make allowances. Nobody should be using the term oriental or half-breed. Okay? Things like uh, Serving white patrons before someone of color, displaying swastikas or Confederate flags. These are micro assaults. Confederate flag is not an expression of culture or heritage. Sorry. You lost. This is the United States. It's a democracy. The Confederacy was not about one person, one vote. You lost. This is America. It's a democracy. Sorry, but I, you know, for me, this Confederate flag is the same as a burning Klan cross. I do appreciate when the enemy announces himself. And if you're declaring yourself as my enemy, cool, thanks. I just made the assumption anyway, <laughs> by the way you talk. Old-fashioned racism conducted on an individual level. So often in private situations that offer the perp, perp anonymity or insulation. can take the form of telling a person of color that another person used racial terms and then denying saying anything when the person of color reports or confronts. That's a very popular game there within an office setting in the workplace. 
So perps often hold notions of minority inferiority and will display them publicly in loss of control situations when they feel safe, either anonymous or protected. So often you can, you know, they lose it. They get mad at you and you just don't nigger. Micro-insult. Communications that convey rudeness and insensitivity, demeaning a person's racial heritage or identity, subtle or not so subtle snubs, frequently unknown to the perpetrator, but clearly convey a hidden insulting message to the recipient of color. I was selling insurance in LA, and uh, I was renewing this guy who had what I thought was a British accent but not quite a British accent. So I said, oh, are you Australian? No. Are you British? No. You from New Zealand? No. Where are you from? I'm from Rhodesia, but a bunch of monkeys renamed it Zimbabwe. $20, please. What can you say? All right? So. Micro insult. He wasn't calling me nigger, right? Bunch of monkeys renamed it Zimbabwe. So, for example, affirmative action innuendo. The most qualified should get the job regardless of race. Okay, but do the most qualified get the job? Or is it your relatives? Oh, do I say that out loud at LCC? How did you get your job? So, AA quotas. <coughs> Got you your job. Like there's a quota, right? So 40 black people have been hired by Lane Community College in its entire history. There have never been more than 12 on main campus at any given time at the peak in 1999. Uh, five. So, white instructors fail to acknowledge students of color or throw things at them or downgrade them or eyes glaze over when you talk about certain issues. Micro-invalidation. So micro-insult, micro-assault, micro micro-invalidation. <clears throat> micro-invalidation is the last one. Characterized by communications that exclude, negate, or nullify the psychological thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of a person of color. So, for example, when I talk at a, well, when I'm excluded from talking at a gang symposium about, okay, people, the reason that white kids are joining gangs, as you are saying, is because they feel that you are invalidating them. It's not because of economics. They're reacting to certain cultural conditions. So there's a science for this. Well, what do you mean there's a science for this? I said, well, if you're, the people that you are dealing with that are working with minority youth refer to those minority youth as tar babies in front of them, then I would make the assumption that they're not going to be very effective with minority youth. If your anger management program call, has a white person calling a black kid nigger as part of therapy because that black kid lived in Elmira and got called nigger until finally, when complaints didn't do anything, he basically launched the legally sanctioned preemptive strike and beat up five white dudes that had surrounded him after school. And one of them called him nigger, so he beat down five of them by the himself. But he gets the assault for. They get nothing. And now you, as part of therapy, at John Serbo, at the anger management class, call him nigger. You can't react. Uh, that is not in our science. Well, what science do you mean? In black psychological science, what, do you, what problem do you have with it? Harvard or black? Okay, you don't do that with, in black psychiatry, or you are not qualified to do that in black psychiatry. 
You don't do that. We don't do aversive. We do skill building. <coughs> oh, well, we've never heard of that. <laughs> okay, microaggressions has been on the internet, is whatever. Uh, give you the American Psychological Association. What do you need? Oh, well, no, you're crazy. That's a quote. Compliments about one's speech or diction with underlying assumptions of foreign birth. Where are you from? You speak so well. I don't see color. We are all human beings. Are statements that neither acknowledge, negate, or neutralize systemic discrimination. The effect to negate is to negate the experience as racial and cultural beings, regardless of the intent of the speaker. So this is actually from Daryl Sue's paper from 09, I believe. Racial microaggressions in everyday life, and I can put it up on the site if you want. So, the nine types of microaggressions, the nine species of microaggressions that Sue et al. have talked about. Alien in your own homeland. Where are you from? Like you're not from here. Ascription of intelligence. So this can work one of two ways. Either they don't think you're very intelligent because of your excellent suntan, or you're so very articulated, articulate for one of your race, one of your kind. Colorblindness is a microaggression. Criminality or assumption of criminal status. Many of us have been racially profiled or rousted at Walmart. I don't know why you go into Walmart anyway, but, you know, picked up by security and suspected of stealing something. I mean, we've actually, I've actually had that going into Nordstrom's or Nordstrom Rack or Macy's or whatever, wearing a suit and a tie, getting followed around by security in Valley River. Denial of individual racism. I'm not racist. I have a black boyfriend. <laughs> I have a black friend in, I had a black friend in the high school. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, cultural competency doesn't get transferred in the sex act. <laughs> Myth of meritocracy. You all, you know, stop using racism as an, as an excuse, you just work hard. Pathologizing cultural values, communication styles, accents, things like that. Second class status and environmental validation, which uh, we talked about posters and other things within the environment. So in terms of looking at therapy, <coughs> the statement that people get, alien and in your home, homeland, in your own homeland, you're not a real American, you're not qualified, a description of intelligence, assigning or being surprised at intelligence, color blindness, race and culture do not really affect people's lives. You're making excuses, quote unquote, playing the race card. Like if there's a card in a deck, who minted the deck? And how come the race card is an ace when you use it and a joker when I use it? Or best of two? of diamonds. So criminality, assumption of criminal status. I talk, I've already talked about my racial profiling here, right? Did I do that? I'm getting old. There's some things I want to forget. I'm living, I first moved to the Whitaker because I didn't know that the Whitaker was, in 1985 was a ghetto. Who knew? Ghettos in Eugene's have lawns and cherry trees. Okay. So I'm working for Whitebird. I'm wearing my Whitebird softball t-shirt, coming back from a game in my old beat-up 1974 Plymouth Valiant Slant 6 with a smoking feature. <laughs> Pour oil into it and, you know, smokes like James Bond, right? But it runs. Bulletproof engine. So I'm coming back from Washington uh, Park, the Cheese Park, as the kids call it, and um, softball game's up, and I'm driving along, driving back home to Fourth and Blair, and uh, I notice a police car pull behind me. 
So I just run through, okay, got my license, registration, insurance, I'm cool, everything's working, fine. Oh, the fastest way to get home is gonna look like I'm trying to evade them. Right turn, left turn, right turn, left turn, lights go on at the red barn, I pull over, I get out, my license and registration. Oh, it's a woman cop. Cool. All right. I'm cool. All right? I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm cool. Right? What's the problem, officer? Uh, your left taillight was blinking intermittently. Oh, that's LAPD excuse number 357. Okay. Uh, so I go to check, right? Because in those old cars, if a single light bulb goes out, the whole system goes out. So I knew it was working. So she lying. Okay. But I have to be polite. Don't go check. Can I see your license and registration? Okay, sure. Here. Yeah. She's looking at my license. She sees, you know, how old I am, right? Have you ever been arrested? We're going from a taillight to my arrest record? Really? Seriously? It's Sunday. I'm around the corner from home. I'll play. Why not? Sure. I was arrested once when I was 17. 17 arrests? <laughs> Did I stutter? Was, was my diction off? I mean, 17 arrests? No, officer. I was arrested once when I was 17. What was that for? Theft? Oh, wow, now we're into harassment. Cool. It's time to check back, you know, the protocol with LAPD, because I grew up with LAPD, right? Where you, st in a, the era that I grew up in, a black man stood a 50-50 chance of surviving a routine traffic stop with LAPD. So you go hyper polite. Slow your diction down. Check the badge number and the name. I'm checking her badge number. And right after, what was that for theft? <laughs> what are you staring at? Like I'm staring at her breasts. I'm looking at your pistol marksmanship badge, officer. You see my wiper t-shirt? I'm a drug counselor for wiper. That means I have to have, I have a master's degree and I have to have experience with drugs and counseling. I was, arrested, I was arrested once when I was 17. I was the only black kid in a car full of white kids in the West Valley. They thought we were smoking weed. We were, but <laughs> they have to catch us, right? That's the game, right? We're in the West Valley. Yeah, they thought we were smoking weed. They made us get out of the car, strip searched us twice, two different stations. Et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even have to tell you that because of 17, the record's closed. Right? That's my only arrest ever. Do you have any other questions for me? Do you have any wants or warrants or traffic tickets? Not in this state. What state? <laughs> I'm from LA. Do you know anybody that drives the speed limit on I 5 between San Francisco and Los Angeles? Have a speeding ticket's paid off, no warrants. Go ahead, run me through NCIC. How do you know? I'm a drug counselor, I deal with felons, okay? I know what NCIC, I know what you, you've already run my plates and my license. You know, <laughs> why are we doing this? By now there's a crowd and they're going, <coughs> they're, they're stepping up to me because, you know, they heard the 17 arrest thing and step up. What was that for? Theft? Uh, okay. So I met her a year later. Slightly different circumstances, and she claimed not to remember that incident. After arresting a black kid, a black skater, who was, um, got called nigger, got called stupid nigger by a shop teacher. And so being a skater, he dosed the shop teacher's coffee with acid, LSD. 
That's an assault four. Right? No, he just was a little disoriented, didn't really have a trip, but but he got expelled for that because it's a weapon. And he came to my school and explained what that was because a bunch of his skater friends had told me you know, about this black kid that had gotten expelled, etc. District doesn't have any records of that, but whatever, that, that was the story. So I meet her when she's the school resource officer at South Eugene, and I said, so you remember that incident with the skaters and they dropped the acid in the guy's coffee and... Yeah, she said, those guys didn't have any remorse. And I thought, do you remember the race of uh, the person that did it? Oh, well, I thought they were all white kids. I know the kid, he's my color, so it's kind of hard. Do I look white? So, okay, people want to be colorblind, right? But it plays out differently, right? So racial profiling is when it becomes institutional power, it might be individually a microaggression, but when you have a gun and a badge, it becomes institutional racism. Specifically, social structural violence. Okay, because there's the assumption of criminality. Oh, black man, Whitaker, beat her car. And the way she explained it, because she claimed not to remember the incident with our interaction, she said, oh, well, I was fresh out of the academy, and we had gotten trained in a particular way, and there had been a re release of black felons from the prison, and they were settling both in the Whitaker and Springfield. So, wow. Okay. So I should have, like, moved to South Eugene. And I should... so. You should know that I haven't been racially profiled since I started driving a Volvo and other cars. Still get speeding tickets, though. Deservedly. That's not racism, huh? From L.A. We don't consider it speeding. We consider it proceeding efficiently. All right, denial of individual racism. Your racial oppression is no different than my gender or class oppression. Well, maybe the same system producing it, but it is different. Where it is different. Myth of meritocracy. You need to work hard. If you don't succeed, it's your own individual fault, not the fault of the system. So in therapy, when we basically talk about what people are reporting, we basically gave them a, another, a, we say, as we say, reframing. Pathologizing cultural values, communication styles. So for example, saying you have borderline personality disorder when you are loud, emotional. You black people are so loud. <laughs> you gesticulate. I'm intimidated. I'm scared. They, they have said stuff like this in the workplace. Okay? This you when you avoid I, social, it gets, give you a, Social anxiety disorder as a label when you avoid eye contact, because some cultures, to look somebody in the eye, especially if there's an authority figure, is disrespectful. Second class status, so the level of welcome or white preference shown uh, in the level of welcome. And environmental validation, building names, pictures, staffing reflect that you don't belong. Only white people can succeed are people who take on the outward values. You're an outsider. So the, the reason I spend so much time is because most of the time you're not getting called nigger or a name. It's microaggressions that are happening to you. But well, the way they often work is that they're ambiguous, so you don't know whether or not they're messing with you. And if you raise it as an issue, they say, well, you're too sensitive. You're oversensitive. So microaggressions occur most often and contribute to hypertension and other long-term chronic diseases. So they're not necessarily lynching you, but they are raising your blood pressure, causing diabetes, causing you know, long-term stress-related diseases. So if a client's culture has developed skills for dealing with them, the skills should be engaged, encouraged by the therapist. So this came out of black science. So one of the ways that we have dealt with this is first you've got to be able to talk about them with somebody that knows and can impart the skill. And part of the skill is, yes, if it feels weird, it happened. 
act like it happened. Okay? Because there's various ways of dealing with it and various skill sets. Okay, and so when you look at, you know, in terms of um, translating this across other characterizations, other types, other forms of discrimination, people develop their own coping skills. So, you know, I'm, I'm the father of daughters, and they're good, you know, so socially approved good-looking daughters, so... They develop skills about, you know, how do you deal with some when somebody hits on you? you? Give them the right number, give them the wrong number, you say I have a boyfriend, that actually no. You know, how do you handle them looking at body parts? It's whatever it is that's gender specific. How do you what are those coping skills? So you begin to look at talking about that cross culturally. So positive, so because this uh, came out of um, black scientists, basically the idea of creating positive racial self-identification, identification of role models, elders, historic and scientific contributions, psychological, cultural, spiritual constructs, and skill building technologies. So as an example, and I had to create this six types of isms because nobody was talking. People kept saying, it's racist, it's racist, it's racist. All right. The type of, yes, it may be racist, but they didn't call you a name. So you have to be able to deal with that because you're working against their denial. And you still have to take care of yourself. So one of you wrote in your reaction papers... They were really pissed off about the way Charlotte got treated in the history books. How, do you, how dare you call a black queen of England the monkey-faced little princess? That racist a-hole. Okay, you can be outraged, but remember how Charlotte acted. Okay, she just <laughs> raised the 15 kids. She played her harpsichord and did her knitting. She ran the country while George was crazy. And Parliament allowed her to do it. So at least they recognized her skill. Yes, there were some racists, and some racists did write the history book. But Mozart composed stuff to her. They named a flower after her, and that's my mom's favorite flower. And you look at Charlotte as a princess, she is fine and brainy, four languages and harpsichord, I mean, okay, Jesse Jackson, not that I always like him, but he's one of the best deterrents to racism is excellence. You are just so good, they can't tear you down. So you just have to be good, real good. So positive racial self-identification. I am an African in America. I have a 2,500 year history here as a scientist and explorer and trader. Yes, there were slaves in my background, but we freed ourselves, not Lincoln. That's my role model, Frederick Douglass. Okay, you don't have to believe in black Jesus. You don't. But W.E.B. Du Bois believed in black Jesus, and Frederick Douglass, and Harriet Tubman, and Malcolm X, and Marcus Garvey, and Nkrumah, and I'm going to go with them rather than Billy Graham. You do what you want to do. Role models. My elders raised me to believe that. So I'm going old school. Okay? Historical and con scientific contributions. Psychological, cultural, spiritual constructs. So, psychological constructs. Racism exists. Okay? It screws us up as well as White people. White people are us. We've been around for a quarter of a million years. They've been around for 22,000. Uh, they're the youngsters. Youngsters try out new stuff. So they got some great stuff. But what they need is, okay, you need to go deeper than 22,000 years because your elders know some stuff. You can't just throw out the baby with the bathwater or whatever, right? So be cool. Be who you are. 
So, identification of microaggressions is one of the skills that comes out of this science. Did it happen? We look at, we want you to look at the internal reaction and the response to microaggression. If it felt wrong, you need to deal with, yes, it did happen, and apply self-care strategy. So understand that if microaggressions raise your blood pressure, left nostril breathing for three minutes. Written on the pyramids. It's our stuff. Okay? Yoga is our stuff. Not just for rich, blonde, white girls. This is our stuff. Chill. Okay? That's one. Eat right. Don't be eating those high, salty foods, those oppression food diets. I love my gumbo but not my pig's feet. Self-care strategies. So, response. You vent, use appropriate humor, give instruction to the perpetrator. I was eventually able to meet with that cop on a level. I said, look, I understand. You're a white woman, lesbian, in a ma macho male dominated organization with a history of discriminating against women and minorities. You had to confirm. You had to act all hard. I understand that. Not personal. But you need to understand that this is, this is how that came up. Alright? So, give instruction if they'll listen. Any of these can be subject to the damned if you do, damned if you don't rule. It won't always work. They might not be ready to hear it. I mean, it's especially when you try and talk about this with your friends, your partner, all this stuff that you learn, and they say, no, that didn't happen. Harris is making this up. I know it's crazy when you refer to yourself in the third person, but you know, I'm just quoting what other people have said in the past. I'm hiding behind my race. So, what forms of discrimination do you see which affect you? Which forms do you do to yourself and that you do yourself? Is a good question to begin asking. So, an evolution. So, we start talking about interlocking systems of oppression and interdependent systems of empowerment. So, there are interlocking systems of oppression and there are also interdependent systems of empowerment. So this is kind of like a rule like the laws of thermodynamics. For every ism, there is an equal, there is a corresponding privilege system. Okay? So I have black male privilege. But male privilege allows me to walk across the parking lot at night at Lane Community College and not worry about being sexually assaulted. The women in the room do not have that privilege. Okay? The only place that I have to worry about being sexually assaulted is prison. <coughs> that is not the experience of my daughters and my female relatives or the women in the room or in this college. It's a system of male privilege that puts that in place and makes that normal. Okay? So, for every discriminator, system of discrimination, there is a privilege system. Now, you didn't set it up that way, but it exists, and we can name it. Part of the purpose in conscientious is down, bringing up that word again, you recognize that you have privilege, and you work to dismantle the system by making other people aware of it, and yourself aware of it, particularly where you benefit from it. Okay? So I can overcome racism first by how I talk and overwhelming them with intellect. Yeah. They say that they're, I'm intimidating. You're just so smart. You overwhelm them with their big word. It's, I'm speaking English. Speak English. I am speaking English. 
You know, in Django, speak English. Yes, my kind sir. <coughs> For every schism, there's a corresponding privilege system. So making the privilege system visible diffuses some of its power. Isms dehumanize and divide what I'll refer to as, what we refer to as universal practices unite and empower and rehumanize. So universal precautions is the equivalent of universal practices except in healthcare. Universal precautions, this is why paramedics wear gloves, your dentist wears gloves, because we assume that everybody is HIV positive until proven otherwise. So we protect ourselves. That's universal precautions. Universal practices, we assume that if you speak English, you are infected with a meme of racism and all the other isms. You're either a target or you benefit from them. Make that assumption. And we protect ourselves with knowledge and skill. Now, you know, when somebody last term said, oh, you, you don't seem as racist as I thought, or as my roommate thought. Like, why? I'm taking you to rehab. Uh, <laughs> how is that racist? What? I said, what was once done to us because of race is now being done to you for money? That's racist? No, that's not racist. I'm just telling the truth. You're being discriminated. I am an upper middle class black person, a college professor. So I have class privilege over you. Poor unemployed alcoholic. Non-drug addict, me. So, yeah, if I were just a pothead, uh, that's considered better than you being an alcoholic. That's actually considered cool. So I have advantages. I have privileges, even though you think I'm lower than you because I'm black. I have an excellent suntan. Hmm. So, universal precautions, we talked about that. So... <clears throat> We invented, me and uh, Remy Callalang Kal invented a construct called CRASH. Now the concept is intersectionality and uh, one of the first places it was articulated was a group of black feminist lesbians in the 70s that called themselves the Combahee River Collective after Harriet Tubman's battle, the battle in which she freed 700 slaves. So the name was intentional. And they basically said, as black lesbians, we have to partner with black heterosexual men in a liberation struggle. In a liberation struggle that our white feminist sisters do not often understand because they won't deal with their racism. They don't. Audre Lorde, a famous black lesbian poet, actually talked about this. She raised a heterosexual son. And she says, my white lesbian sisters walk across the street when my son is walking down the street with me to avoid my son. What's up with that? And he's not heterosexist. He's not homophobic. What's up with that? You need to deal with your racism as well and your other ism. So, Kumbaya River Collective uh, basically talked about intersectionality. Uh, Remy Callalang and I came up with this construct of crash. Classism, racism, religion, addiction, ability, age, sexism, heterosexism. So, C, R squared, A cubed, S, H. Basically saying there's interlocking, interacting systems of oppression, also known as white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, if you like Bell Hooks, Appalachian, or Alan Johnson's, the kinder, gentler, the matrix of domination. The idea is these systems come out of what is referred to as patriarchy, which this is why I said earlier, probably the first discriminator because it's happening among black people I'm saying that Abraham was a black person. The first discrimination was sexism against women and women-centered or egalitarian-centered religion. 
right? So patriarchy is what we call that. So crash comes out of patriarchy. So classism, racism, religion, spirituality. So this is sublimated under racism. Religion and spirituality sublimated under racism because I want you to notice that there is a hierarchy in our society, in American society, and as a reflection of Western civilization, a hierarchy of religious expression that is racially charged. Who has power? And which religions have power? Which religions are even considered religions? Okay, so I would propose that the Abrahamic religions, starting with Protestant Christianity, Catholic is below Protestant. How can you tell? Well, look who gets elected president. Who's considered white? White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, WASP, right? There's a reason for that. Why did they make such an issue of Jack Kennedy, John F. Kennedy being Catholic? He wasn't the first, really, but that was an issue. Now, you know, during the last debates, you know, Paul Ryan and Joe Biden both being Catholic. Oh, well, first time we have two Catholics debating each other and a Mormon and... Yeah, whatever, okay? Where are Mormons in that hierarchy? Above or below Catholics? Below. Below. Hmm, where are Jews in that category? Above or below Muslims? Above. Huh, why is that? Hmm. So, the Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they are elevated above Native American spirituality. They are elevated above even African forms of Christianity. You don't even know that there are African forms of Christianity. Silence is deafening. Okay? Would it be okay for you to, you know, rock climb on the Kaaba? No. Would it be okay for you to rock climb on the Sistine Chapel or the National Cathedral? No. So why is it okay to rock climb on the Bear's Lair, what you know by its English name, the Devil's Tower in Wyoming, during the August Lakota spiritual ceremony? Why is that okay for white people to rock climb and say, oh, well, we don't care what you, if it's your sacred place. We don't care if it's the sacred black hills. There's gold in them now hills. We don't care that it's your religion. Did you know that the Pentagon is built on a native sacred site? Oh, let's not build a mosque on ground zero. That's a Muslim victory dance. Like the Pentagon is not a victory dance like Stone Mountain. So again, racism is playing in whose religion is considered a religion and whose is not. The Abrahamic religions are elevated and not all the Abrahamic religions. So, I really hated to hear this about Israel. Generally, I support Israel's right to exist. I don't support Israel's right to be racist. So, came out as a news item that the Israeli government has been shooting Ethiopian women who are Jewish, who are living in the state of Israel, with Depo Provera without telling them that they've got, so it's a contraceptive, so they can't have babies, without telling them, saying it's an immunization. Yeah, like catching a baby is a sickness? Why are they doing that? Huh. Hmm. That's not good. And this is like five years ago. Just coming light to light again because there's a lawsuit coming up. They wouldn't let Ethiopian soldiers who had emigrated from Ethiopia to Israel when they joined the Israeli army. First, you know, it was a long time before they'd let them emigrate, but once they did emigrate, when the Israeli soldiers who are Ethiopian descent giving blood as part of the blood drive for the blood bank, they were throwing it away without testing it because of AIDS. Wait, Israel has nukes. 
and they had AIDS testing. So you test the blood like anything else. This is like almost like the South. Oh, well, we're not testing black blood because we don't want black blood going into white soldiers. Wow, really? You're, you're seriously doing that in 1980, 1990, the year 2000? Wow. Please explain that. Boom. So Eve, that can happen within a relation within a religion based on race. So that's why it's under there within crash, these observations, right? Addiction, age and ability. So these are all discriminators. Alcoholics are treated different than meth heads who are different treated different than pot heads. And then definitely age and ability. <coughs> I am temporarily able-bodied, okay? But I'm also out of the, the uh, optimal hiring age at 58. I'm considered too old. So I guess I better stay here. Sexism, we talked about some, and heterosexism. So the matrix of domination, interlocking systems of discrimination. So this is not so much a oppression Olympics. So these are divisive practices. It's not so much an oppression Olympics. We can't say that a black lesbian in a wheelchair who's poor and a crack addict is going to be more dis you, you, That would be crazy to think about that. But there are, to understand that there are interlocking, interacting systems. So universal practices are basically looking at, for example, that there is a hierarchy that we can talk about Natarianism within religion, which basically comes before the Abrahamic religion. We can look at ability where access, the platinum rule, the platinum rule is where you do unto others the way they want to be done unto you, unto, even if that means better than you. And there's a biblical reference for that too. So not just the golden rule, the platinum rule. Which is more valuable? Platinum. Do unto others the way they want to be done unto. Even if that's better than you. Especially because it's better than you. So age, apparent, uh, your apparent age, like, you know, I look younger than I am. You don't look. Yeah, we won't go into that. Alternate and indigenous or indigenous gender roles for sexism and heterosexism. Basically saying there's not just two genders, there's probably multiple. Why force people into two that they don't fit? That's like saying there's two races. No. There's the human race. So you either say there's one gender with lots of gender expressions or there's multiple gender expressions. So intersectionality is what this is generally called. Interrelated, interlocking systems of discrimination. All right? So I, whether you're a counselor or not, right? So in the matrix, interlocking systems interact with each other so that a poor, black, disabled, lesbian, agnostic could arguably be in the least powerful social position or add effect of multiple forms of discrimination unless she's the CEO of the organization, right? Which could trump all that, right? So your task is to become aware of the systemic barriers, give skills to overcome them from your position of power and privilege. And there is one because college education confers power and privilege. It does. Okay? And to have assimilated or acculturated to the values of the culture that created a college. So you replicate them in your knowledge, skills, and ability. So you could have sacrificed or closeted part of your identity to get your degree. That's part of the price that you pay in doing this. So this will be up, and I'll also put a book list up later when we get the YouTubes and other links. <laughs> Bartman or Bartram? <coughs> Two ways. I heard that name. Why have I heard that name?